if you start creating content and you start creating videos that say the same thing exactly and factually, yeah, of course, you're, you're not going to be able to compete with somebody who has a huge production value, is, is able to really hire somebody or themselves a professional speaker. Yes, that's much harder when you just go along the sides of information, purely educational information. Sure. But we are not purely educational information people. We don't just download ChatGPT into our brains. We we have emotions. We have entertainment value. Welcome to the Business Ownership Podcast, brought to you by Awareness Strategies, helping you navigate the waters between entrepreneurship and ownership. Hey there, peeps. This is Michelle Nedelec, and I'm super glad that you're here with us today because I'm here with my most amazing guest, Stefan. Stefan, thank you so much for being here with us today. <laughs> oh, it's my pleasure. I'm excited. We're going to have fun. We are. So give us everybody the highlight of who you are and what you do for business. Um, I'm a unicorn. I'm the professional unicorn. Nice. And I help showcase what is unique and interesting about people and help them professionally showcase a lot of those things, which if that makes people go, huh, what? That makes no sense. Essentially, what it comes down to is helping people creatively communicate their business and their passions in a video format. Um, I don't do social media, but I help people make the videos that might go on social media and make them seem a little bit more human or unicorn, if that's what you want to do. <laughs> so give us kind of a little bit of background on how did you, one, select to be a unicorn and two, <laughs> how was it that you became a unicorn? Sure. And, uh, uh, how did you pick the video th side of things as your go-to? So I started off uh, doing something that wasn't very related whatsoever. The video part, that's been since middle school. Whenever there was a project or anything, I would go, can I make a kinetic video, please, please? And sometimes teachers would go, you have just the weekend. You don't need it. I went, no, 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 I'll make a video. It's fine. I, I got this. Uh, there, there was always this passion of finding a different and creative way of doing it, whether it's modernizing Greek myths. That was a hilarious video. Or at one point, we, some would argue, destroyed uh, Hamlet. Uh, in a video that we made, but it, it was, it has been known to happen through high schools throughout the world. <laughs> exactly. Um, I played a character named the detective who actually solved nothing the entire time. And it was a useless character except for comedic relief. Perfect. <laughs> so things worked um, as well as a cue ball. When Hamlet asks to be or not to be, he shakes a little eight ball um, to ask the question. We had a lot of fun with it. And so that's been ever since for, for years and years at this point, decades um, of just, gartering that that creativity and when i first started in business it was not related to video or anything but i wanted to do the videos i love doing that as part of it and that seemed to always stand out to people that even when i did my tedx even when i made my show even when i wrote my book i always did something in a weird creative way um, and i never considered that that would be the business i should go into until repeatedly people would go but how did you figure that out why did you do this you should teach people how to do that and so I said, okay, let me dip my toe into this. And this is maybe an interesting aside. I always, from, from a young age, had it instilled in me. You go to school, you get a degree, you work in your degree. Uh, and that was very much my parents were scientific-minded people. My dad was a theoretical physicist. My mom's an engineer. It was like, you do the thing your degree says you do. Creativity was not what I got my degree in. I got my doctorate in physical therapy. It made no sense to me that I was, quote, unquote, allowed to do that. But to everyone listening... You're allowed to do whatever you want. That's the crazy thing about life. Um, yeah, it might take some hard work. And so I dove right into it. I took a couple dozen entrepreneurs, uh, some that I knew, some that I found on social media. And I said, hey, let me just trial this out for you. I will write up some ideas for content for you that are a little bit more creative and suit you specifically and uniquely. You try and implement them. Let's see what happens. It's a win-win for you. You lose nothing. Those that implemented it, as is always in life, many people know what to do, but don't do the right thing, immediately saw five, 10 times more likes, more views, more comments. And it really made me go, oh, there's something interesting here. But what in the world do I call this? And speaking of being bound by your degrees and professionalism, I immediately said, well, I've been called a unicorn for a variety of different reasons. I always tend to stand out in different ways. I love colorful things. Here I have all the colors behind me. My favorite color is purple. So I said, I'm going to be a unicorn. That's what I'm just going to do because I want to find that unique thing. And I immediately thought, oh, nobody's going to want to work with you because they're going to go, unicorns are not professional. Uh, you like th what This kid thinks about magic and business. That makes no sense. And so in order to overcome that objection right off the bat, I named it the professional unicorn. So that by default, everything I, no offense, but I everything love that. Is <laughs> and so that is how all of that came to be in that interesting way is combining that human side of me 
with the professional side. So for those of you who doubt the professionalism, it's right there in the title. <laughs> Just Can't saying. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. So now that you've become a unicorn, and this is hilarious because I kind of feel like I'm interviewing a unicorn. <laughs> so, so now that you've done this and you've placed yourself in the professional world of Wall Street, <laughs> who do you serve and support and who's your ideal client? Ideal people are, are service-based business owners uh, because effectively the service that I provide is that we take an hour of, of content with you, of video content that we record there and I direct you through and we chop it up into small little segments and clips. And what that does is help showcase your humanity on video because I consistently hear the thing of where they go, I hate doing social media, I hate doing cold calls. But what I really like doing is getting on one-on-one. -on -one. I just want to talk to people. Well, video is the second best thing to that right before that step because they see the most of you, they get your emotional side, but most people read scripts. Um, and so it's the people that really, they know they need to be doing social media. They don't have the time. They don't know what to say on camera. They feel awkward. That's it. We solve all of those problems because it just takes an hour of your time and you have a month worth of content as a result. But at the same time, social media agencies, I love them. Because I'm not a marketing agency. I don't want to do social media. I just want to help people create videos. And so those are also great partnerships in that sense for me. Nice. So for those of you who are listening on a podcast, no, I am not actually interviewing a unicorn. And no, there is no <laughs> unicorn avatar <laughs> talking to me right now. It's actually a real person. It's all good. <laughs> so for those who just got a little wigged out and went, ah, oh, but I don't want to be an avatar. I want to be a cartoon. Um how do you take their uniqueness if it's not as kind of outgoing and bubbly as yours and and find that little something, something? Because I know a lot of entrepreneurs are like, yeah, but I'm not that interesting. I'm kind of boring. I just, you know, I just do my thing. And so there, there's a twofold part there. One of the reasons I love being this bubbly, almost some people would say ridiculous version is because it lets other people go, oh, I can step out of my comfort zone a little bit because of that guy is ridiculous. Um, so just, it, cre it creates this thing. Okay. Everybody's going to be looking at him and they're going to be like, all right. Um, so it's a little bit more tame and it just, it, it opens it up to, to go, Hey, this is accepted. This is fine. I have yet to see a client that goes quite as ridiculous as I do. Uh, most, most everybody I work with rather tame, rather simple. The disconnect happens is where they go, well, I shouldn't talk about my personal life. Um, I should only talk about my business and my services. And the only issue there is that immediately, as soon as most people I hear do that, it sounds just like every other person who talks about their services. So the kind of step-by-step -step how I help pull it out is we first just start talking about you as a human. And some of that recorded content we don't even use. I'm just trying to get you out of your shell to talk about the thing you know, which is you. I hope you know yourself. I, you spend the most amount of time of your life with yourself, I hope. Um, but you know yourself and you know your humanity. So we're trying to get your humanity out. It doesn't mean we have to go deep and dark stories of your childhood. That's not your humanity. It could also just be of you love unicorns as well, or you like eating mushrooms and anchovies on pizza make you throw things at walls. Whatever it might be, we're, we're taking that piece. As soon as I get a little bit of a humanity across, I then jump into right into something business related. And most of the time, this is very jarring for people. And they immediately go back to the, I am a robot that talks about my business and I'm going to say these things. And then this is the magic, is the third part. The third part is where I have to quickly pivot to where I connect the thing you said about your humanity and the thing you said about your business into one kind of a thing to where I go, oh, okay, so you're an accountant who hates anchovies on pizzas. If As much as hating anchovies on pizzas, how much do you hate blank in, in your accounting thing. And all of a sudden you get these answers that are rooted in the humanity of the hatred for anchovies on pizza, but yet with the wonderful information the accountant has to deliver to their clients. And now other haters of anchovies on pizzas can connect with them and really connect with their humanity, but also understand what they do for their business. And that really makes people stand out and shows their unicorn self. Nice, I love it. And I have noticed people that tend to be kind of naturally good at talking about things that are going on in their life and how it relates to the business. Um, would you say that you've found kind of a magic number as to how long it might take for somebody to move into kind of going from my life is my life, my business is my business into this kind of really neat um, weaving of personality into business? So it, it varies person to person, but usually this is a, a good kind of marker for it. 
most of the time people don't see the connection points the way that I see the connection points as in with the anchovies and what they might hate about um, accounting. But there's, there's a definite piece of where as that is pointed out more and more to them, eventually they start seeing it as well. And they start noticing that the things that they do in their normal everyday life that they take for granted relate to their business very much so. In my experience, it actually takes about three to four months, but I have also had people that after one session, the next time that we do a recording, it's a completely different person. All of a sudden I'm like, have you been trained? Like, what did you do? And for them, uh, the biggest thing that I hear is they're like, well, you know, I listened to each snippet, each clip when we were posting it. And I realized, oh, here are the connection points. And because they were their own best student and they studied themselves in their lives, they started noticing those connection points. So I wish I could say, there's a definite answer, but it could literally take anywhere from just an hour of a recording to even several months to help um, kind of find and cultivate that. What I don't think it takes, and I haven't seen that it really takes, is years. Years. I, that, <laughs> Which that, is good news because that's kind of what people <laughs> are thinking in their mind is, oh my God, it's going to take forever. Right. And it's, I think, because the biggest thing is I allow them to be themselves. And so all of a sudden, instead of building new bridges, we're just breaking down barriers that they felt they couldn't go through. And that's much easier to then let things flow as opposed to building something brand new. Nice. Well, and I particularly like that it's kind of what I'm going to call in short order, because I think a lot of business professionals, whether it's lawyers, accountants, engineers, things like that, think that there needs to be this professionalism to their business. Therefore, they can't talk about business. But then you look at uh people like Elon Musk who are always out there talking about themselves and they have very much become a personality around the business and there's a, actually a lot of CEOs like that that have become the personality of their business so it's not about airing your dirty laundry and it's not about you know <laughs> wearing cartoon hats there's this fine finite place in the middle that allows you to become personable and the face of the business yes and I think more and more with the internet, what you're saying is becoming more and more true and more and more accessible. We are now as business owners becoming more and more our own personal brand. Uh, because now almost anybody be can start their own business and be a solopreneur or have a really tiny team and work for themselves. And immediately the question has to be asked, well, what makes you different from the other person? What makes your accounting firm different from that other person? Or life insurance. So many people now they hear life insurance and they run the other way. Right. But there's there's a service provided there. So what makes you different? What makes you not the type of person? I just had a client. Full disclosure, I'm not a big fan of crypto. Many people that talk because many people that talk to me about crypto, I'm like, no, I, this looks like a scam. I'm never going to do this. And we just recorded with a client. And I thought I might actually want to get into crypto because the way that he explained it, I went, oh, there's so much more to it. And I didn't immediately go defense mode up. And there were a lot of people that may have said the same things or have said things about crypto, but it doesn't matter. The way that he delivered it resonated with me. And I think more and more that we can show our personal brand, we can then relate to those personal people. And then that's why they choose us, not because we do crypto or we do accounting, but because we do crypto or accounting. Thanks. I like that. Well, and one of the ways that I've described this in the past to clients is if you take a song that's been done by a second artist, the melody can be the same, the music can be the same, the notes are the same, everything's exactly the same, but it's the singer is different and you have a completely different song and you can be a fan of both songs or you can go, oh, I really like this one or I really like that one, even though the song's exactly the same. So is there aspects to that that you see uh, especially with something like financial services where you get, you know, 10 of them and they're all like, yeah, I'm a broker and I'll do the best for you. And you're like, yeah, I get that. And <laughs> so, and then they, do they have the kind of the reservation of, you know, how do we make this unique? How do I make me, me? Absolutely. Yes. Um, and I hear that a lot from a good number of them literally saying, yeah, but there's already content out talking about it. And if you start creating content and you start creating videos that say the same thing exactly and factually, yeah, of course, you're, you're not going to be able to compete with somebody who has a huge production value, is, is able to really hire somebody or themselves a professional speaker. Yes, that's much harder when you just go along the sides of information, purely educational information. Sure. But we are not purely educational information people. We don't just download ChatGPT into our brains. We 
we have emotions, we have entertainment value. So an immediate easy one is stories. The stories you've had with your clients, no other accountant or person has had with their clients. There's going to be always something a little bit different about the story that you can tell. And that's why storytelling is so huge in branding and all these things, because they work. It combines the emotional and the entertainment with some of the education pieces that you might need. Um, and so that's where I find that even if you have 10 people, you have to help them focus. If there's a lesson you want people to get, maybe tax season is coming and this is a mistake people make. Great. Tell me about a client that made that mistake. And all of a sudden you have 10 different stories. And those 10 different stories will relate to 10 different potential clients for those people, as opposed to if all of them just said, tax season's coming, you, you better hurry up. Thanks. And what would you say to people who have kind of a limited client base and they're like, oh, I don't want my clients to know <laughs> all these stories out of school on them. <laughs> so I, um, I've, I've done the, the TEDx talk and it was an interesting thing because they kind of say, you want to tell a real story, but uh, it's okay if you change it a little bit to make it more interesting, uh, which then I go, aren't we just lying to people? And they go, well, no, the message and the core of it is exactly the same. You're just, you're communicating and presenting it differently. And I thought that was just so cheap and unfair, but the more and more I look at some of the, the favorite stories, the stories we love and we hear from different people that we look up to, a lot of times they've been altered ever so slightly to make them that much more kind of interesting. To that degree, you can alter your stories. You don't have to say the specific clients. Um, also, if you keep it anonymous, nobody's really going to know. Um, and this is one of my favorites when people go, but everybody's going to see it. They're not. Um, I, I love you guys. They're not going to, nobody's going to see it. Not really, like comparatively. I believe on Facebook, it's something like 10% of your followers actually see the post that you put up. So you would literally have to post it 10 times of the same thing for everybody to maybe see it um, if, if they do look. So there is that piece of change up the story. And if you go, my life is boring. I have no stories. I have no clients. Nothing is happening for me. Nothing exciting ever happens. Where do you get your inspiration? What are, do you, did you hear a story? Can you reshape that story and tell it from your own perspective uh, that you may like it, right? In, in that sense. Or how about you stop telling stories about your clients and you tell stories about your kids? You don't have to use names. You don't have to show your kids on there, but sometimes your kids will teach you random things about life and you just relate it right back to what it is that you're doing. It doesn't always have to be clients because I feel that majority of people, business owners, they do one of two things. Um, they either sell way too much when they make video content or they never sell at all. Um, very few are right in that sweet mark of where they're providing value and also letting people know this is what I do for my services. Um, and it's because that you're afraid to go in the opposite direction of where you usually are. So tell the stories from your life. It doesn't always have to be from your clients and just emotional connection and entertainment and a little bit of education. Nice. So when it comes to putting on video in, especially in social media, is there a, a happy place of selling and informing and just hi? <laughs> Yes. So in general, there's just keeping a good um, kind of level of, I would say, 30, 30, 30, and then 10 for selling. So 30% educational uh, content, 30% entertainment content, 30% emotional, and then 10% is the selling. Let's dive a little bit so people don't go, where do I put e each one of these? Education are really that, that content where you go, here are the three tips. Here are the three specific things you need to watch out for. Um, or whatever it might be, where the, the main purpose of this piece of content is to provide an educational piece of value. The emotional can educate a little bit, but you're really trying to help people maybe, I hate to use the word push on their pain point, but showcase the pain and say, hey, this is how you could relieve that pain. There's a lot more of the emotional side. This is where stories play a lot more. Entertainment, above all else, make it fun. Sure, horror can be entertaining for some people, but I just feel that mostly we're lacking fun. So fine, th this is maybe where you might do a silly dance, or if you don't like a silly dance, um, you might tell a joke or whatever else it might be. Um, if you're terrible at jokes, please don't force yourself into it because it's so cringy. Um, though, if you like telling cringy dad jokes, that could be your brand, I will say that. And then the final 10% is the selling. And the selling is really where you go, these are my services, and this, this is what I provide, this is the product that I have, whatever it might be. And you're really focused on saying, this is what I do. When you have that whole kind of um, melting pot of it all, people have multiple touches with your content. The misconception that I think a lot of people have with social media is 
somebody's going to see one post and they're immediately going to become your customer. No, that doesn't happen. There are a lot of touches and a lot of things. And that's why if you only do selling things, they don't know anything about you. They don't understand what value you provide or how they could connect to you as a human. If you exclusively do the value in the human, they don't know that you actually do this uh, for a living and that you they might pay you to do something like this. Um, and the final thing that I'll say on that, not to get too convoluted, people try to overcome it by saying, oh, okay, what I will do is introduce myself at the beginning of every one of them and then talk about my services and sell at the end of every single clip. And unfortunately, that will categorize all of your clips as selling because then people know you're just there to hook them in to make a sale as opposed to freely providing the information that you're there to give. Right. I can totally see that working with you for half a second would <laughs> increase creativity because all I could think while you were talking about that a little earlier is, oh, you could have somebody that's really boring in accounting telling stories about how, you know, businesses died because they did their thing and you could do a whole Halloween special that ends in and they died. <laughs> <That's> like... <laughs> I don't know how professional that would be, but it'd be really funny and I would watch them forever. <laughs> there you go. So any any accountants or anybody listening, steal the idea, use it, do it. Exactly. And then tag us, send it to us. We'd love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. What was one of the most fun videos that you ever did? Oh, um, for my personal brand, the, the, the most fun that I had was, uh, so... I, I interviewed with a potential client and she does uh, fractal services. And one of their things is at the end of the year, she appreciated everybody so much, she calls their professional sapphires. And so she made everybody a wand. Um, and to kind of, and it was, she hand put in some stones into it. There weren't actual sapphires, guys, not, nothing like that. But it was just this very cool thing. And after we got off, I just, I was so inspired. I had to make a video for them. I just felt like I, I, I wanted to. So I made this whole video and I used a wand. I used a, a, a rainbow radiant straw as my wand um, in this specific video. And I got to put in some special effects with stuff. But at the same time, it was very much a selling point uh, because it was, it was really talking about how when you don't just hire a personal assistant or somebody else through them, you really hire a true gem um, kind of Aww. a thing. Yeah. And it was... That was probably in, in recent uh, times, one of my favorite videos because I had so much fun doing it and it put in so much of their personality as well into it uh, that that was, that was the most fun for me. Nice. I love it. So when you're working with somebody, do you typically work with them as a one-off and go, Hey, I've got this idea. I want some stuff done. Can you do it for me? Or do you prefer to do kind of like year long contracts where you're building a bunch of stuff for people? How do you typically work with people? So the best way to work uh, in, in this specific, uh, we'll go big view and then break it down to, to, to monthly kind of things, yep. is a six month uh, contract. So in six months, at the bare minimum, you're getting 30 clips per month, which means that at the end of the six months, you have 180 clips total, which some people may go like, okay, isn't that enough? It is, it is enough. That's the beauty of it. That's why I said six months. You wanna be right in the mark of 150 to maybe about 200 clips total. Once you have that big library, they are all clips that are showcasing your humanity, which probably isn't changing a whole lot, and your business, which I hope isn't changing a whole lot over the next several years. You can now post and repost. You can easily post the same piece of content two or three times a year. Nobody's going to notice. And to those people that go, what if they do? That means they're paying attention to your content. How amazing is that? You're lucky. Good for you. You did a good thing. Uh, almost nobody's going to go, yeah, I've already seen this. What else you got? Okay, they're probably never becoming a client of yours, so don't even worry about those people. They don't matter uh, for you. They matter in the <laughs> in their scheme of things. <laughs> yeah. So once you have this wonderful thing, you're you're good to go for two or three years. You you don't need me. So I I, I really want to make sure that people understand it's not that you have to always be churning out content because that's what a lot of social media people will have you believe that you have to do it all the time and it's just a grind. So what that means is that you need the 150 to 200 now. I have some people that go, hey, uh, maybe I just need to work with you for a month and then skip a month and then go from there. And we can we can work that out. Usually when we work, we record an hour and we clip it into anywhere from 30 to 60 pieces of content. So if you really want to go all the way in, in three months, you could have 180. You could do 60 times three and you could you could be set for what it is that you need to do. However, like we said at the very beginning, as you go further and further, you get better and better at the speaking. 
So a lot of times what does happen is by the time we get to six months, I have some people looking back at the month one and month two, and they're going, maybe we just do a couple more months just so we have some of that higher level, the confidence in some of the things that they're delivering. So sometimes it goes further, but at the same time, a lot of it is that they're already going, nope, this is great, we're good, uh, and let's keep going. So we usually work anywhere from three to six month kind of contracts. Nice. So other than somebody whose current marketing is kind of falling flat, what are some of the other stumbling blocks somebody might be having and they're thinking, oh, Stefan, I need you so badly? Time. It's It comes down to time. Most people, the amount of time and expertise that it would take for you to figure out what you need to talk about, film it, and edit it is ridiculous. Um, and most people go, oh, it's just, it's just a quick video. The amount of times I've heard people go, did you like this reel that I made? And I'm like, yeah, it was good. Like, yeah, I spent four hours doing it. I was like, that was a 30-second video. You spent four hours doing a 40-second, a 30-second video, and it was good, but it, are you really going to do this every single day? You're going to spend four hours every single day doing this? No, of course not. So it's a huge time saver because the input from you is one hour a month. That's it. That's all that you need to do. The other piece, of course, is I don't know how to do it. I don't, I don't know what to talk about. I feel uncomfortable on camera. And the uncomfortable on camera piece is real. When we get one-on-one -on -one into calls, people are lovely. They're charming. They're, they're human selves. As soon as they get on, on various video recordings or even networking events, you're like, who is this robot? This, I, I don't understand who this person is. And so that is the piece that I think really differentiates the way that we do it. Because we get on a call, on a virtual call, we don't record on the call itself. I just help direct you through and guide you through. I don't give you scripts because you're not a script reader. You're a business owner. Um, I, I basically help you showcase your humanity in that, in that sense. And that is really hard to put a price on. Some people, they really need their hand to help because they just go, I have no idea what to talk about. After 30 seconds, they go, that's it. I have nothing else to say. I'm like, I'm sure you have plenty of things to say. There's a lot more. So the two big things, time, because so much of it is just a time suck. And then I don't know how to be on camera and what to say on camera. Those are the best people for me. Nice. Well, I know there's a lot of people going through those issues. So uh, for those who want to start their journey with you, how do they do that? So stephansavalin.com, you'll find a lot of unicorns there. Don't be surprised. You've been forewarned. Um, there's plenty of rainbow colors and everything. Um, and on there, you can easily just either contact me or schedule a call with me through that. I, and you can get a, a free ebook, guys. It's a, if, if you want to get started and you're going, I don't know about this guy. Um, there's a free ebook on there that is 101 creative content ideas. I don't try to sell to you in that book. I literally just give you a list of 101 creative content ideas by industry. Uh, so that if you just wanted to start doing a, a few things yourself, great, grab the book and then start making videos for yourself. Otherwise, stephansavlin.com, you'll find me or Stefan Zavlin on most all social media. Nice. I love it. We will, of course, have all of Stefan's links on in the show notes. So just scroll down, go ahead and click those. Be sure to open up a new tab. Keep listening because we have more. So Stefan, at what point in life did you know that you were especially kind of crazy enough to think that you could become an entrepreneur? <clears throat> all right. Deep story, crazy story time. So in grad school, I was getting my doctor for physical therapy, and this was up in Philadelphia, and I got a parasite in my eye. And the interesting part of this is I, from birth, I had one good eye and one bad eye. The bad eye, the optic nerve didn't develop halfway. Um, and so there's nothing that could be done about it. So the parasite decided that I won the lottery and went into my good eye. De uh, being misdiagnosed for a while and all these other things, because it's, it's a rare parasite. But anyway, long story short, multiple surgeries. I ended up losing the vision in that eye. Um, and it was also nerve damage. Uh, so not really able to help with anything. Because I was in physical therapy, a lot of the things were hands-on and manual. So I was able to still get into the clinic and still work. But because nerve damage, my vision was going down, 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 slowly but surely. And eventually, I, it just got to the point where I couldn't do the documentation things easily because it's such fast-paced things when you're, when you're in healthcare. Um, it's really hard to take the time that you need. And I said, that's it, guys. I'm done. I'm leaving the clinic. And I started my business, which is what the book, the TEDx talk, and the show that I created were all about uh, of reducing how much we're sitting. And so that got me into it because I realized I love teaching and I love doing things my way. And I can't be part of this other corporate thing uh, anymore. And so that's, that's what crazily got me out of it. Um, the crazy story, since we're going way into it and you use the word crazy, is 
the the company will remain nameless, but I don't really care. I will tell anybody who wants to listen to it. But I got my paperwork finally of my document of I am legally blind. And I got called in and they said, hey, we need to talk to you. We have a meeting with your manager. And I was like, great. I need to talk to you too because I have something. And that was the document that I was legally blind. I sat down with them and they're like, you go first. And I was like, well, I have a document. I'm legally blind. I need accommodations. We got to figure this out because I've been really slowing down. And they looked at me and they said, oh, that might change things because we brought you in here to say that we're putting you on a plan because you're not meeting requirements. I was like, okay, well, perfect, because this is the explanation of why I'm not, not meeting the requirements. And unfortunately, what ensued was either a misunderstanding or something where the HR person repeatedly told me that I would first have to go through with the plan. And then if I didn't meet the plan and didn't meet their expectations, they would give me accommodations, which seems insanely backwards to me. And in the midst of us figuring out why this was bass backwards, uh, we basically, I got COVID. And I got long-term COVID and it was, it was just as COVID was, was starting out. And I, I, it took me about a month and a half to get out of it, by which point I said, I'm not going back. Um, and so it was the craziness of being blind and getting COVID that jettisoned me into entrepreneurship as crazy as it sounds. And how do you become a video editor when you're legally blind? Right. It's so misconceptions uh, about being legally blind is people go, oh, you see just black. So everything is blurry to me. Right. I can still make out shapes. Like, for example, I um, I don't know what your face looks like exactly. So if I see you on the street, it's sorry. Um, but I know the general- <laughs> As I make faces out of it. <laughs> right. Um, the other thing is I've got a big monitor. We have a lot of technology. We can zoom in. We can do so many things. And in that sense, I don't feel limited. Uh, but it also helps me be a little bit more creative because for me, a current social media trend is people do just text on video and that's it. And you have like seven seconds to read a novel on this tiny little post. I hate it. I don't, well, I can't read it. I don't even look at those posts. I refuse. And I, I don't think it's nice because you're just trying to grab the person's attention and go through. So I just say, no, we can do better. Let me find creative ways how we can use this how we can use uh, text-to-speech in those clips. And so I'm able to create different kinds of content. To give another tiny example was the TEDx talk in terms of the blindness. Didn't think I was gonna do that thing blind, but I did. And when I got there for a rehearsal a week before the actual recording of it all, most of the other speakers had their notes printed out. They had their whole speeches printed out and they would refer down to them every single time. I didn't have that luxury. I had to have mine prepared way in advance. And I had it memorized about two months before we even had to do it all. I was able to deliver a much better and a much more fluid talk because I didn't have to focus on memorizing the words anymore, which would not have been the case if I wasn't blind. So interesting silver linings. <laughs> well, and that does bring up the question of depending on somebody's audience, right? If, I mean, anybody over 50, I'm going to say, is not going to sit there and read <laughs> text <laughs> Go, mm -hmm. it's not gonna happen if that's your audience and so many times i see people wanting to have like a six point font <laughs> website or on the other side of things they want everything to be a 25 pixel point <laughs> it's like no it's probably not it either <laughs> otherwise you're reading the rabbit went <laughs> it's like, okay i get it but there's Guilty. only room for one <laughs> word in this one. so how does somebody, I mean, I'm assuming that you would kind of work with them in their audience and go, hey, you probably don't want to be doing this anymore. Um, is that kind of how it goes down or is there other ways that people could discover what works for their audience? You, you, you hit the nail on the head with the second part is part of it is it's combining what are you comfortable with doing and then what works for your audience. What I don't like seeing entrepreneurs doing and business owners and really most people on social media is where they say, I'm gonna change myself for my audience. Where they go, well, other people who you know buy fashion, this is what they do, so this is what I'm going to do. What you're basically saying in terms of the branding and marketing for yourself, but really branding specifically, is you're saying, my brand does whatever my audience wants. We don't, we don't wanna connect with that brand because we wanna know that you will stick true to yourself. And the reason that I wanna be part of what you're doing is because you're gonna keep doing that thing. Because if, if Starbucks all of a sudden started selling kombucha and no coffee, we would go, um, excuse me, 
you to it's Starbucks coffee. It says it at the top. What are you doing? Uh, we would not like that a brand to do that, even if they go, yeah, but our audience said they would love kombucha. That makes no sense. And so a lot of business owners say everybody else is doing this, so I have to do it that way. And so that's the first part is, well, what are you comfortable with? And then what is your audience responding to that you're comfortable with? And then let's let's mirror those two together. So if somebody, for a while, I had people that aren't comfortable being on camera. So what we did instead is we took some pictures that they had, we typed up the text that they would have, and then put it into speech uh, or text to speech. And so they now had a voiceover that wasn't even them reading the voiceover if they were uncomfortable. They had all of these moving pictures that made it a little more entertaining. And it was so much better and performed so much better than somebody going into Canva, slapping a quote across some kind of colorful little background and saying, there we go. I just made 52 posts for the year. No, And who's going to care about that? Just because everybody else is doing it doesn't mean it's working for everybody else in that sense. Absolutely. So and at the end of the day, I think we need to understand that one, we're human and two, we're relating to other humans. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so that's where the real magic happens. Awesome. Stephen, you've been absolutely awesome. Any last words for peeps? Um, so I have, I have a presentation that I give and one of the things we, we talk about branding, communication, creativity, and it all comes down to one specific thing, which is be yourself. And many people go, oh, okay. So authenticity, not even as much authenticity, as much humanity, be yourself to, to the degree that you're feeling comfortable to be the human version of you and showcasing that we know that people buy from people. And so what you need to connect is to the is your human self to the other human self that is going to be buying from you. You don't need to do anything crazy. You just need to be your human self. That's it. Awesome. I love it. Thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it immensely. And I know how valuable it is. My absolute pleasure. This was a blast and just flew by. <laughs> awesome. Peeps, this is Michelle Nedelec. Thank you for being here with us today. Be sure to subscribe to the show and share it with your friends. We love helping entrepreneurs grow. Thank you for listening to our show. I'm all about being a resource center for entrepreneurs to give them the information and the support that they need to make it in business. As such, the notes for this show can be found at our website at awarenessstrategies.com slash blog. Be sure to subscribe, give us a rating, I like five stars personally, and share with your friends.